Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. Alrighty, find a way in, find a way in. If you're in the foyer, make your way in. Come on, Pentecost Sunday. Come on in, come on in. Let's get ready to worship. If you guys would, would you just stand to your feet as we get ready to go into service? Ooh, that beat. That is so dirty. I love it. All right. That's a, that beat, that just gets you all ready to worship. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, hey, going on right now, just so you guys know, every Friday morning. Somebody say Friday. Friday. Somebody say 6 a.m. Somebody say, that's early. But how many of you know the glory follows the early? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Well, every Friday at 6 a.m. right here in this auditorium, we are opening our doors going forward. We started it this week. Every Friday going forward, we have a one hour of prayer. It's going to be amazing. We could not think of a better way to not only start our weekend, but end our week then starting it off with an hour of prayer. We go hard in the paint. It is awesome. There is some worship. There's just some singing with the Lord. You can walk around the auditorium, do your thing, sit on the floor, uh, write things down, journal with the Lord. But it's an incredible time. And I would encourage you, invite your friends, get involved with this, because we had a powerful time on Friday. It was early, but it was worth every moment. Let me tell you. Sound good? All right, so that's Friday, 6 a.m. right here. Then directly following service today, we have got... Um, porn free going on so porn free we meet up in the upper room up there um and basically this is a bunch of guys getting together and we are just crushing addiction to pornography we are walking in our identity of being a new creation in christ and it is a good time and how many of you know battling alone is never the option come on somebody we don't fight alone we fight together we fight stronger we go hard and it is a great time of just being honest and real and getting with scripture and getting with brothers and just fighting it and uh, winning the battles. Does that sound good? So today, it's up there in the upper room. Make sure you're there if that's something that interests you. 30 minutes following service. But hey, if you need prayer at the end of service, there's a banner back there. Some of us will be back there. Uh, we would love to pray with you at the end of service during the last song and just see the Lord's best come about in your life. And if you're new with us, we have this awesome welcome home card. They're on or around your seat right now. Fill one of those bad Jacksons out. Place it in the uh, containers out in the welcome center. We just love to have your information, you know, um, be able to get a hold of you, be able to see how you're doing, how you like church, how we can help uh, find you a place where you want to serve or somewhere to be in with community. Does that sound good? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, hey, it's Pentecost Sunday, and I'm feeling a little bit generous. So who wants a T-shirt? Oh, come on, somebody. I see. I see. I see. Underhand with the, with the, there we go. All right, anybody over there? This one won't fit you, bro. I'm telling you. Check the container. All right, it's going over there. Someone's going to be great. There it is. All righty. Well, hey, we're going to pray and we're going to get into it. Does that sound good? Amazing. Father God, we just thank you so much for today. King of kings, Lord of lords, we, we are here for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to grow in your image and likeness. That has become more like your son, Jesus. So today, just like you did in the book of Acts, Father God, would you just come? Would you rest on your people? Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you fall in this house? God, today we want to see things we've never seen. God, we are, we are young, but we are bold, and we are willing to say, God, that we are not interested in church as it's been done for the last 30 years. We are interested in church as it was done in Acts, as it's been done in the historical church. So, Father God, this morning, would you fall? Would you come? On the backside of our singing, on the backside of our prayer, on the backside of our praise, God, would you do something crazy today, God, that is so undeniable that Jesus changed my life today. The Holy Spirit came and he intervened in my life today. Today I walked in new gifts. Today I had my destiny realized. Today I heard the call of God on my life. These are what we want to hear today, God. I left without injury today. These are the praises. These are the words. These are the testimonies we look forward to hearing on the backside of this. So Father, come have your way and we will be sure to get out of the way and give you all of the glory and honor that you are so richly due and all of God's people who are ready to worship their faces off scream to the top of the lungs and you said amen. amen let us worship come on guys
why.
would have you read some of these prayer cards and you'd feel really bad. You'd feel like, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way we can win. Like, people are in such pain and such hurt. A lesser spirit would have you read them and you would just see utter hopelessness. But we look to somebody way better than that. In Revelation 5, an angel a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice said who is open uh, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals and this is for the redemption of all of creation in John in this moment he saw there was no hope whatsoever and he completely broke down he was weeping but everybody who is in the heavenly spaces knew better they said there is somebody who has been putting in some work who, who paid the price and did everything that needed to be done so that the, snow, the scroll could be snatched out of God's right hand and these seals could be broken so that the contents of this grand plan can be executed. So an elder said, what are you doing? Stop weeping. Look over there. And then Jesus rises up, still wearing his wounds, and he takes the scroll and he gets started. That's, that's, that's the hope that we need to be carrying when we read heartbreaking things. Wait a second, okay, it's okay to be there. But remember that there is, there is wisdom from heaven where, where, uh, where an elder would say, hold on a second, just when, when you're done, make it quick. There's somebody to look to about this. So when we pray for this healing, we gotta start with a couple healing praises because there's a lot of them. So we're not just praying, praying out of out of nothing. We're praying because we've seen it happen already. Uh, Evan said, "Dad's test results came back, and it's not cancerous." Amen. Guess what? We're praying about that, and it can't happen. Micah said, "God's answering prayers this week. I'm sure He's continuing to put His healing hand on those who need it right now." After losing feeling in my legs last week, on top of some sort of virus. After rest and scripture reading, God was able to restore the feeling in my legs. And as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Fletcher, Scott Fletcher's dad, he was in a really rough place. We didn't, we didn't know what we knew, but doctors didn't know which way it was going to go. They couldn't find any solution. He swallowed a camera pill, which is crazy and a real thing. Praise God for doctors. But that just showed to prove that the pictures that they were taking of the inside of him was that the issue was being, was healed. This is what we're talking about. When we're praying and we're staying steadfast and we're believing and we're continuous. So pray with me in confidence that this stuff has to go for the people that you wrote down, for the people that, that, that you're advocating for. We're going to advocate together in expectation that these are all going to turn into praise cards. And if you have any um, uh, a pain or sickness in your body right now, steal this, piggyback off of this, because it's happening now. Um, right now, Lord, we're, we're praying over a mental breakdown. The Lord, um, you... <laughs> You can heal the most complicated things, the things that are so simple to you and so complicated to us. So Lord, we just call this mind into correction. Lord, it would see the world how you see it. It would see hope. It would see yourself. Lord, you would just come and move and completely take this man back for yourself. We're playing, praying over Alex and Truett for an absolute quick and speedy recovery today that when Josh gets back home, It'd be as if not, there was no sickness in the house at all. So Jesus, heal Alex, heal Truett right now in the name of Jesus. We're praying over an injured leg. If anybody else has an injured leg, touch that leg in Jesus' name. That injured leg has to be healed and repaired right now. Lord, you created it. Lord, you certainly know how to repair it. So in Jesus' name, leg be completely restored. We're praying over... Uh, a grandpa with dementia and who is in extreme pain. Lord, we pray that you would just take away that pain. You would bring his mind back to think in the ways that you want him to think. So Jesus, come and do all of these things. You're the only one who's capable. We lean on nothing else but you. Jesus, come. Pain, you have to go. Mind, you have to be set right. And Lord, we, uh, we believe that um, we have come a really far away praying over COVID. 
Um, but Lord, we're going to continue. Lord, it's not as uh, you know deadly as it once was, but it's still lingering. It's holding us back. So Lord, we're, we're praying over the entire world right now. In Jesus' name, COVID, you have to be completely finished. You've held on long enough. We're ready to move on. Lord, I pray that just glory from yourself would just be brought to the world through how Christians are fighting and standing up for health and gathering together. That Lord, there just be such a testimony of healing and goodness that would come from this. So Lord, come and do what only you can do. And I pray that you would take all credit and no other credit could be given to anything else except for you moving in powerful ways. In Jesus' name, amen. our final request for now. Lord, we, we're praying for revival in Grand Rapids. Lord, we pray for the, the shootings to stop. We pray for mental health and that people would just be restored. We pray over the country, but God, we, we, we have our stake in this city and we pray over churches in other cities, but God, we pray over Grand Rapids. Lord, heal the minds. hearts. Lord, I pray that you would just you would just inject the city with Christians that are that are just gonna move into the darkest places that would that would miraculously go in and meet the people who need a word from you the absolute most. But we're asking for 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 miracles of contact with Christians. The absolutely broken people who are about to do the most horrendous things testimonies on testimonies in the city, God. From the Saul's turning to Paul's in the city, Lord, you would just activate us and move. Holy Spirit, move in us. Put us in their way. In Jesus' name, we, 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 we need this. In Jesus' name, come and do it. Amen. Got a few more praises, some big ones, y'all. Um, thanks for standing, standing with me, um, and standing with all of us. This is this is uh, this is how we this is how we see change, and we we are seeing it. I hope you can hold on to faith and know that these praise cards are maybe more important than the prayer cards sometimes, because man, it's it's what we stand on. Um, Allison's got two interviews. We pray over these interviews. Uh, new opportunities coming. Uh, talked a couple weeks ago about jobs big deal this is this is ministry time so lord i pray that you would you would just put her in the exact position that you want her to be in around people that really need her in jesus name god is so faithful to create a passion within me to impact families and education second interview with grcc coming up this opportunity will be a pay increase as well as god opening more doors when you don't see any change. It's a tough season. God is always working behind the scenes. Praise God. I love it when they write a they write a sermon on there, so you don't even have to like improvise. <laughs> um, so filled up after Friday morning. There's a plug right there. Make it to Friday morning if you can. Breakthrough is happening here. Let's go church. Love you all so much. Feeling well enough to be restored here today. Let's make it happen. Let's get restored. Why not? Why'd you show up? You showed up for it. Me and may as well go in. <laughs> uh, Angie moving is moving forward with me. Well, this is a double dose. Yeah, in the in the process. Let's go. Um, and this one, y'all, let's get loud. Reese, take your lady by the hand right here. Getting married next month. He says, praising God for putting Brooke in my life blessed to be able to marry my best friend so bless you guys go go chat with them uh later on but um we're gonna bring nikki up for our offering message now all right so just to begin there are three ways to get there's this qr code um otherwise they're all listed there um, I wanted to start in Hebrews 13, um, verse 14 through 16. 
So it says, for we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such offerings are pleasing to God. So I wanted to um, talk about this verse because what stood out to me was um, that the author wrote, there is no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. So just with that perspective of just the, everything that we have here, everything that we hold dear, all of our money, all of our possession, all of our things, our time, our efforts, they're here, but this is not going to last. It's not forever. Um, these things, they die away. They're, they're not um, eternal, like our, our future home, because we truly are citizens of heaven. So with that in mind, um, just holding, just not being, not living with the attachments that we have here, not clinging to the things that we have here. So earlier in this chapter, I think verse five, it says these offerings, um, or to not have a love for money. Um, It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he will never forsake you. We can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Which I think is just beautiful. We have no worry. We can be confident in our God. Um, another version says, this offering or contrib contribution, the sacrifice that we make, this offering we make, um, is an expression of fellowship. We offer, the offerings we give, we give because we're in agreement with God's will, right? And it's pleasing to him. These sacrifices do not go unseen because these sacrifices are the praises of our lips. Um, yeah, so that's what I had. I'm gonna end with this, this um, benediction, which is also a really beautiful prayer um, as we end this offering. So it says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So with that, we have Pastor Adrian preaching a message. So fire. Good morning, good morning. You guys, I know that we don't have to be like the most excited. It's okay, okay? We, we gotta do a little bit better than we've been doing. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Okay, this morning, we're gonna start off right off the bat. We're gonna do this creed that we've been doing every Sunday. All right, so I'm gonna say it and then you're gonna say it after me, okay? All right, God make me a voice in this generation. God. Make me a shepherd after your own heart. I want to know you for real. I want to burn with your holy fire. I want to feel what you feel. See how you see and move like you move. I open my heart to you. Release upon me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your son. Set my heart on fire. Make my life a life of prayer. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I never know how to do that incrementally. Sometimes I feel like Matt doesn't like go long enough. He just like takes us at a word at a time. And I'm just like, come on, we need three words at a time. Let's do this thing. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, you guys, if you're new here, my name is Pastor Adrienne. I'm this guy's wife. Um, we love what we do. We're so grateful to be here. We're grateful that you are here. And this morning, just right at the top of my message, I do want to say that we are a learning, growing church. It's organic. You know, Amy mentioned this morning, church hurt. Sometimes that is a real thing, 
okay, that people deal with. And they come here and they bring that with them. And I just want to say, you never have to worry about that in this place. We are so transparent and we are so open to y'all asking questions. We do this life together. Does that sound good? Okay, because we're all at different places. We're all at different places. We all have different understandings. And, and the thing that matters is that the Bible is real cover to cover. We believe it all the way. Jesus came, he died, he rose again. He's our savior and he's brought us the Holy Spirit that lives within us, okay? If we've got that in a transparent community, nobody's gonna be getting a hurt up in here that can't be healed. Yes? Yes? Okay, so this morning, um, as I was beginning to just hear, even at the very beginning of this whole um, series that we're doing the, about the wilderness, I got really stoked, got really excited because I think that there's something really beautiful um, really, really powerful about we're calling ourselves away from the busyness of the world and going in to the wilderness. And I realize like every single message here has like three titles. There's like the series title and then the tag title and then there's an individual title. So then the tag title of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I got really excited again because I think that's one of the best cowboy movies probably ever made. Can I get an amen? Yep, over there. My dad's the one who showed it to me. So I love it so much. And when I think of the wilderness, oftentimes when I hear about it in the Bible, I think of that kind of landscape, the desert. It's dusty. It's arid. There's not a person for <laughs> miles and miles around. You're alone. You're by yourself in solitude. And today, we are going to be talking about the wilderness. And more importantly, we're going to be talking about some of the very specific people who at different times, different seasons in their lives, find themselves in the wilderness. Do you hear me? All right, okay, okay, okay. My title this morning, the tide title title, is Desert Dwellers. All right? Jesus, we welcome you into this place, God. We're so grateful to be here, Lord. I know, I know, I know this was a heavy week. There's a heaviness in this place, Jesus, but your Holy Spirit, I know you are lifting it. I know that as we come with burdened hearts, as we come with, uh, with offense, as we come with hurt, as we come with not understanding, Jesus, I know that you are just standing there waiting for us to cry out to you, God. And I pray that the Holy Spirit within each and every one of us would rise up right now. God, that you would give us new revelation. Jesus, that you would refresh your people because your people are tired, God. That you would restore to us hope, Jesus. That you would give us joy. And all of God's people said, amen. So, I need to say right off the bat, I'm so grateful for this community at TakeOver. Are you guys grateful for this community at TakeOver? It's really hard to come and be at TakeOver and, and not be seen and, and be loved. You've really got to try hard. You gotta like hide in a corner under a table and we're probably still gonna find you. Yeah? So I gotta say personally that I love this community. This community is, is the result of God's faithfulness and honestly so many answered prayers on, on my part because I spent a lot of time as a young person very lonely, desperately lonely. I had an incredible family. I have an incredible family, and they're my best friends, but I was so lonely when it came to relationships and friendships with other people, and I tried so hard. I changed myself to try to foster relationships that were not worth a fig. They weren't real, and I, I look at this place, and I see all of these people who I've been doing life with for some years, some moments that have felt like years, and I thank God. I thank God for this place, and I hope that you guys, too, do that, too. So during that point, I was at a, at a place where I was really hurt. I felt really cut off, and I just was mostly very, very sad. I spent a lot of years just wandering what felt like a wilderness season for me. I, um, I took to books a lot. I read a lot of books, and I made a lot of friends in books, but who knows, that's not really... It's not really a relationship that gives as much as it as one of these does, yes? One of those books that I found while I was on my, my wilderness journey was this book that was a real life account of this guy called Chris McCandles. And the book was called Into the Wild. And it was about a young man who rejects society. He rejects the hurt and the pain that has come his way because of humanity. And he goes and he lives out 
in the wild. And I was absolutely enamored initially when I grabbed the book because I was like, yes, this is the answer. Deuces world, I'm out of here. Gonna go live in the wild, gonna go live like the Unabomber. Just kidding, not like the Unabomber. Just kidding. Gonna go live out in the sticks and get weird, right? That's what happened to him. He got weird, he got weird. He pulled away from society and I was like, this guy, he's gonna do it the healthy way. He's gonna go just live out, be a monk in the wild and it's gonna be awesome. And I realized that's a really unhealthy mindset. Yes, I'm being vulnerable here. I'm, I'm being vulnerable in sharing that that was a mindset that I had. I had a disdain for humanity because I'd felt so cut off, so exiled, so wounded, so hurt. And if we look at the tragedies that a lot of these people have come out of, they start there. They start that way, they feel that way. They feel cut off, they feel like they don't belong and they get weird. There was a quote at the beginning of the book and the quote is by Paul Shepard and it says, to the, to the desert go prophets and hermits. Through the desert go pilgrims and exiles. And I love that quote. I'm going to read it again. To the desert go prophets and hermits. Through the desert go pilgrims and exiles. And that quote had always stayed with me. At the time, I recognized that I was not a prophet. But I certainly responded very strongly to feeling like an exile and someone who, who wanted to hermit away from the world. The, the relation of feeling lost and really betrayed by humanity. And I, I drew back to that quote as I prepared for my message today. And I think, when I think of the wilderness, when I think of being into the wild and choosing a life in the wild, I can't but help but think of John, the baptizer. We know who he is? Yeah? Some of us are a little bit more familiar with Jesus, but John, he was right there. He was right there with Jesus from the very beginning. And as I thought of John, I thought, obviously, of Jesus, who was also a desert dweller for many seasons. And if we have John and we have Jesus, we also have this category from that quote, of a desert dweller, a hermit, an exile, or a pilgrim. These three categories, they fall into this place of wilderness journeys. Because John and Jesus also had wilderness journeys, yes? The wilderness just was very different for them. And we're going to talk about how different it was for them versus how different it would be for an exile, a hermit, or a pilgrim. And we can all have wilderness journeys when it comes to seasons of pain, of brokenness, of deep searching, and today I'm going to take us on a journey through a compare and contrast, an examination of John, Jesus, and the desert dweller, which is going to be that last category. And these last persons, we're going to see a need for God, community, the importance of our prayer life. And that wandering the wilderness for the sake of the wilderness and without the presence of God is void and futile. Amen? So, this morning, if you're taking notes, which you should be. Everybody should be taking notes, right? Did everybody bring their Bibles this morning? Okay, let me see your Bibles. Just put them in the air. Okay, okay, all right. I'm getting more and more excited as I see, like, the like leather or the, the leather backs coming in, okay? So my challenge to y'all is every Sunday, bring your Bible with you. Your real, real Bible. And if you don't have one, I'll buy you one, okay? So anyways, we're going to have three categories. Make a category for John. Make a category for Jesus, and then make a category for that desert dweller. All right, so this morning when we begin with John, the baptizer, he is one of my favorite dudes in the Bible. I get so excited when I read about John because he was a little bit of a weirdo, and I think all of us can relate to this guy, yeah? He was just, he was a little out there. And I know that we all know about the birth of Jesus, right? You better all know about the birth of Jesus. We celebrate it every single year. But what we don't always remember, we don't always read about, we don't always recognize is the birth of John, which obviously came a little bit before Jesus. But we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about John's birth. So if you take the four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, you can go through and you can read all of the accounts about John the Baptist. 
and they're all they're all the same story, but each of the authors have a little, t they tell a little bit different aspect of John. And in Luke, Luke is the only one who talks about before John was born. So John's parents were quite elderly. His dad was Zachariah. He was a priest. He was a holy man. His mother, Elizabeth, they had wanted children. They were kind of societal outcasts because they hadn't had children. And he's in the temple one day, Zechariah, and he, he's doing the temple thing. He's making the offerings to the Lord. And Gabriel, the angel, appears to Zechariah and says, you and your wife are going to have a son. In your old age, you're going to have a son. And he's going to bless you. He's going he's gonna to make way for the Messiah. And all this and all this. And it sounded so good. And Zechariah was like, dude, I'm old. I'm a little dusty over here. Like, I don't see this happening. I'm sorry. And Gabriel was like, that's okay. But because of your disbelief, you're going to be mute until you see this come to pass. So when Zechariah came out of the temple that day, he could not speak. He had to, like, they had to learn this whole sign situation. He, he was writing things down. He could not speak. But the people who encountered him knew that something supernatural had happened within the temple. He had been changed. He had received some word. Something had happened. And soon after, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant. And she immediately was just like, yes, Lord, yes. I'll take it. I'm excited. I'm going to be a mom. My, my time of shame is over. I'm going to have a baby. She was so stoked. And she knew. And she had faith. She believed in the Lord. And... So she becomes pregnant, and before John was even born, this is one of my favorite stories, he was, she was six months pregnant with John. And it says in Luke 1 uh, that Mary, her cousin, Jesus' mom, comes to visit. And she's newly pregnant with Jesus. She's very freshly pregnant, okay? And it says in verse 41, At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, for your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. So John's not even born yet. He's six months old in the womb. So not really six months old. We don't really count that once you're topside. You're zero. He's six months developed, okay? He's six months developed, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. A baby, a pre-baby, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and so filled with the Holy Spirit that his mother becomes filled with the Holy Spirit in recognition that the very fresh, tiny little baby pregnancy inside of Mary is the Son of God. That's... It's mind-blowing to me. So not long after, John is born, and he grows up in the wilderness. He grows up in the wilderness under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. He was called to be a holy man. He was called to be a prophet. And instead of being taught under a rabbi, he is taught under the teachings of the Holy Spirit in the wild. So when he was born, his father regained his speech. And in Luke 67, he says, And then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He's talking about Jesus now. Because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David. Just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering their sacred, the, his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies. We can now serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And this section is about his son, John. And it says, And you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. He will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because God's tender mercy 
and the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide us on the path of peace. And it says that John grew up, became strong in the spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry. He lived in the wilderness. And when it talks about the wilderness here for both Jesus and John, that they withdrew to this place of prayer, I often see in my mind like this idyllic pasture land that's it's green and lush and there maybe there's sheep frolicking by or something like that. That's what I kind of envision. And really, it, it could have been something like that, the unoccupied hills of Judea. Um, but more often than not, in the Bible, when it describes the wilderness, it describes it as desolate places. Desolate places. And I think the most important part of the wilderness, be it this desert, this desert, desolate place, or this pasture, is the recognition that it is a place without worldly distractions. Yes, it's a place to go where there is no, there is no city life, there is no cultural, social separation. It's a place away from the noise and the rage and the anger and the lust and whatever else that we can find within our societal norms. It's a, it's a place away, a place where we can go alone to be with God hear God better, communicate with him in prayer in a more complete and full way than we can when we're surrounded by the noise and the distraction of the world. Do you hear me? When I hear desperate, desolate places, I think of something that doesn't even have nas- natural distraction. There's no lovely trees, there's no butterflies to distract my ADHD brain. It's a place that is so empty that we actually have to close our eyes against its barrenness to really see God in his beauty and his fullness. That's what I see when I hear a desolate place. It's a place offering nothing so that we have to close our eyes to see everything. Yes? So John grew up there. Jesus often visited there. And some of us, we get stuck there. In our brokenness, in our pain, and without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which can be a very, very scary thing. You hear me? Yeah? What I'm trying to draw your attention to is that the wilderness is good, but it is also dangerous, depending on the posture of our minds and our hearts, just like trying to pick up a rattlesnake. If you have the proper equipment, you can do that, and it's fine. It's good. You try to do it with your bare hands, a little different of a situation, yes? Yes? Posture is different. Could be a very different, different story if we're doing that with our bare hands. So John lives in the wilderness until his public ministry begins. And when it begins, he leads a massive revival, baptizing people in water and proclaiming the need to repent for God's wrath and hot anger are coming. Now, if we go back and we really take a look at John and Jesus side by side, these are some things that we're going to see. So this is the compare and contrast, okay? So write your notes down. To begin, that both of these men knew the importance of the wilderness, what it was to draw away from the city and the world and draw near to the Lord. So if we're comparing, we're going to talk about John first. John was a Nazarite. Does anybody know what that means? Yes, a couple? Okay, so there's a lot of different things that set them apart from other people. They were called to be specifically set apart for God. They didn't drink wine. They didn't cut their hair. They didn't cut their beard. So he's a hairy, hairy dude, okay? So he comes out of the wilderness, and he's got hair up to here and a beard down to here. He's wearing animal skins. He's stinky. He's probably dirty. He's eating bugs and honey. He's just not a regular guy, okay? He looks probably like a bear. They just thought that was like a bear coming out of the wilderness. No, it's John. It's John the baptizer. So he lived a good deal out in the wilderness, alone with God. It's probably easy to to assume that he was probably out of touch with people, right? Probably lacked some social graces. It's probably awkward, 
probably a little bit rude, to the point. He was the only child. So it's not like he had siblings that were he was running around with and speaking to and, and being taught and sharpened by. He probably had friends, but he was probably inwardly drawn. He probably was talking to the Holy Spirit all the time, but sounded like he was talking to himself all the time. He was just an unusual guy. He was very, very strange. He, when he saw sin, he just wanted to blast it. And at one point when he's baptizing people, a bunch of Pharisees to come can try to see what he's doing. And he calls them, he calls them a brood of snakes. So he calls them spawn of Satan. He tells them to get the heck out of here. And it's not exactly a gesture that really like, you know, calls people away from their sin, right? Get out of here, spawn of Satan! I don't, I wouldn't feel like drawn in by that. You know what I mean? I'd feel like, oh my gosh, this guy's a lunatic. What the heck? Is he baptizing people or is he drowning people? Like, what the, what's going on? So that is kind of a descriptor of John, right? Do we all feel like we know John a little bit better now? I think the most important thing, beyond how crazy he looked or how crazy he sounded, which, by the way, is cool that he just was down to look however he looked and was, like, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was like, this is who God's called me to be. I don't care what y'all think. Like, this is, this is who I am. I can be stinky and eat bugs, and I'm down with it. To me, I love that. I love that so much. That's who John is. He was so in love with God, so in love with who God had called him to be, that the world could not make him sway how he felt about himself or his, or his call. And then we have Jesus, okay? We all feel like we know Jesus, yeah? We've all seen the chosen, right? Yes? Okay, good. You better. Or we're going to have a watch party right here. Jesus probably looked pretty normal. I know that guy in the chosen, he's pretty good looking. I think that Jesus was probably just very unexceptionally looking. I think he was probably average height. I don't think he was overly tall or really short or skinny or wide. I think he was normal looking. I think he was well groomed. I think he probably had a tan, a very deep tan because he was working outside all the time and living in the wilderness, but he was clean. He's not going to be dirty like John. He's not going to be looking like unkempt and, and crazy like John did. He's going to be wearing normal clothing of the day. He had four brothers and an unnamed amount of sisters. So he was around people all of the time. He had a big family. He was constantly at weddings and in the temple and in the marketplace. He was constantly around people. You wouldn't have been able to pick him out in a crowd until after his ministry began, began because then everybody knew who Jesus was. But before that, you would not have been able to pick him out in a crowd. He would have looked just like you and me. Isn't that so satisfying to know that God, the Son of God, looked just like you and me? We wouldn't even be able to tell him in a crowd. He wasn't exceptionally beautiful. He didn't look like Jared Leto. Matt wants to say that he does, but he didn't. He was just a regular salt of the earth dude. And I love that so much. He was warm. He was friendly. He was kind. People were drawn in by him. He saw the people who were never seen. He saw them, and they felt seen by him. Instead of John saying, spawn of Satan, and scaring people away, Jesus most often was saying, follow me. Follow me. Drawing them in. They both preached the word of God. I think symbolically, John stood in the place of God wrath, God's wrath, living outside of a really messed up and poisonous system, both within the religious community and the Pharisees, and the culture of the world at large. Jesus stood in the place of God's reconciliation with humanity, not just symbolically, but physically and spiritually through his death. He lived within the system, subverting it by challenging cultural norms, breaking all of the rules from the inside out. John was the very last of the Old Testament prophets. He was the very last, and Jesus was the exact beginning of the New Testament. John represented thousands of years of the Old Testament of man trying to make a way to God. And Jesus represents and is God making a way through his sacrificial death and life again to humanity. 
John baptized people in water, a ritual that was making someone spiritually clean for a time. And Jesus came to baptize people in spirit and fire. This kind of baptism and acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and Savior makes us right before God forever with Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. John came to prepare the way. In Luke 3, it says, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled, the mountains and the hill made level. The curves will be straightened, and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation is sent from God. John was the precursor. He was the forerunner to the one who would equalize absolutely everything. It says there that curves will be straightened, rough places made smooth. John was the warning. Jesus was the way. John was the messenger, and Jesus was the Messiah. In John 3.27, it says, John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. And I love this part so much. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. So that's the church. And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. That has been the prayer of my heart this week, that Jesus would become greater and greater, and we would become less and less. Our offense would become less and less. Our, our ideas that we think are so right all the time would become less and less. Our depression would become less and less. We would be drawn to peace as Jesus becomes greater and greater. And people didn't know what to make of these guys. You've got one guy who looks really normal, seems really cool. You've got this other guy who's really scary. You know, if you want to let him dunk you in the river because you don't know if he'll let you back up. You've got these two guys. And nobody really knows how to feel about either of them. And I think that God so plainly puts this in the Bible. He makes them so different with such purpose. It says that no matter what they were told, even when Jesus and John were saying the same thing and relating back to their shared history as Jewish people, they still could not make up their minds about these two guys. They did not seem to understand where they were coming from, who they were, and their different approaches. Jesus says of John that John is a funeral song. John is like a funeral song. God sent you a funeral song. Seriousness and mourning and warning. And people rejected him. And then God sends Jesus, who is a wedding song. Joy and excitement and celebrating and still, you reject him. And I think that this ultimately comes down to the point that humans, humans, we don't know what we need. We don't even know what we want. We need God to tell us, to show us what we need. For John and Jesus, they were doing what they were called to do. And God is putting this plainly in the Bible so that we can see that we need to rely on him, not ourselves. Do you hear me? And the way that they went about utilizing the wilderness that we've already kind of touched on a little bit, where they used it to come into the presence of God, sets them apart. They saw the wilderness as a retreat. The other category of people see the wilderness as an escape. Yes? The wilderness, are we retreating to it? Or are we escaping to it? So this third category of people from that quote, to the desert go prophets and hermits, and through the desert go pilgrims and exiles. John was a prophet. Jesus was and is the Messiah. But the hermit, pilgrim, and exile, how do they engage the wilderness as an escape? A hermit could be someone who's been wounded, 
wounded enough to remain in their brokenness and to believe that life on their own is better than life within a community. Yes? It's better without the knowledge of God. Better without people. They become closed off, embittered, angry. The wilderness becomes their home. I think we can all think of someone that we know that kind of falls into that category. Yeah? A pilgrim could be someone searching for God, for truth, for freedom. And by doing so, they're passing through the wilderness out of a desire not to remain there, but to find truth and meaning. And oftentimes they do this in a lot of empty things, a lot of non-God things. They often come up dry, and they're just waiting for someone to see them and to invite them in, into the presence of the one true God. An exile, and personally I think this one is the most painful, has been cast out. There was a place where they belonged, but because of circumstances or situations, they have been broken off from where they once were. They have no home. They wander lost, trying to establish new communities and new families where they can fit. These communities and families are often built around virtuous principles but often retain brokenness from their exiled pasts. These people want only to be seen and to know that there is a place where they've always belonged and that just like the rest of us, they have a home in Christ with a load of misfits just like you and me. Yes? All of these people are searching, wandering, lost in the wilderness. And when I first read that book, into the wild. I was expecting the story of a hermit, of a pilgrim, who went into the wild and proved that life without God, without people, living in the beauty that nature has to offer, with just oneself, one's habits, one's hurts and brokenness hidden away from the world, and out of the reach of other people hurting you again, was going to be the answer for me. And it was certainly going to be the answer for Christmas Candles, who the book was about. I thought it was going to show me the way. The way to make the pain I was feeling and subsequently hiding under what people thought was a very happy face disappear forever. That's what I thought. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this story and, and what it taught me. So a lot of this is taken, this little chunk is taken from the summary of the book. Again, this is nonfiction. This is a real guy, Chris McCandles. Actually, you can put his picture up there, Adrian, if you want to. Immediately after graduating college in 1991, Chris McCandles roamed through the West and Southwest on a vision quest, like those made by his heroes, Jack London and John Moir. In the Mojave Desert, he abandoned his car, stripped it of its license plates, and burned all of the cash he had in his wallet and tried to completely disappear. He gave himself a new name, Alexander Supertramp, and unencumbered by money and belongings, friends and family, he would be free to wallow in the raw, unfiltered experience that nature presented. Craving a blank spot on the map, McCandles simply threw away the maps. Leaving behind his desperate parents and his sister, he vanished into the wild. He wandered all over the U.S., hitchhiking and kayaking and learning how to truly rough it in the wild. In the winter seasons, he would pick up work for a few months here and there. He would inadvertently make friends, unintentionally starting to care for those around him, and then he would disappear again. Hunting, fishing, camping, witnessing some of the most beautiful vistas that the U.S. has to offer. He was a wild man who had successfully shucked the responsibility and expectations of his family and peers to search for something deeper something more meaningful than his urban roots have ever could afforded him. But along the way, he realized some things. I think he realized that being alone, all by himself, without community, family, and loved ones, being in exile was more painful than living in the presence of people who might hurt him again and who he might inadvertently hurt himself. That life 
there's more to life than job and a kids and a picket fence and all the things he told growing up that he was important as a man he had to have that equaled happiness there was far more truth in the natural world than there was in the world he'd seen humans building around themselves and fabricating at the highest forms of living all their life in the end this is chris he made his way up to alaska and he found an abandoned bus and he lived in the bus for four months in the summer in alaska might i add it's very different than the winters in alaska he was having the time of his life but i think it was at this period when he realized that life alone as an expat exile as a hermit as a pilgrim was not the life he wanted and he knew that his trip into the wild was coming to an end there was something more he could feel it and he couldn't find it in the wilderness by himself and i want to tell you that sadly chris never got that chance he never got that chance to come home of of the books that he carried that were about hunting and foraging he made a mistake and after he had packed up all of his things and he was ready to come back one day he was foraging and he poisoned himself he poisoned himself dramatically it was not something that could be undone out in the wild he needed help he needed help and by the time he tried to leave he was too weak and he perished four weeks later and they found him in this bus and he had died of starvation because of the the nature of the poisoning he was unable to consume any nutrients whatsoever and he died and two weeks later they found his body some hikers found his body and they weren't even looking for him and they just happened to find him he'd been on this incredible journey <laughs> he'd seen such amazing things but he had no one to share it with in the end he realized that that was not living that was not living community was what he needed and ultimately what he wanted in the end i know that's kind of heavy and i know that's kind of sad but i know that chris realized at the end of his life that torn away from community and doing his own thing and being his own god was not the answer it was a discovery that he never got to live out but we we can we can in this book, I don't know how many copies it sold. It's been around for a minute now. Maybe millions. And I know that it was probably read by people just like me who read it and were challenged by it and decided that the cost of living a life with purpose and meaning that ultimately results in the most painful kind of death was not for me. I got to learn from his lesson. I'm grateful for that because God knows I could have pulled up and I could have disappeared just like that, just like any of us could have. When we engage the wilderness, we need to do so recognizing it for what it is. It's a place where we can retreat to, to be in the presence of God. It's also a place where we can lose ourselves in if we're not vigilant. Do you hear me? Today's world, especially my generation and the generation after, are so hungry for God. They are bursting at the seams to know who God is because they don't know who they are. And if they can know who God is, they can know who they are. We have people who are so desperately searching and they think that they can find it in the wilderness. If you're looking out there, but you're looking without God, without the guidance of a Christian community, there's a very good chance it will rob you of your inner innocence, rob you of your hope and your freedom. You will deconstruct your faith seven ways from Sunday without going through the Bible with a friend, without being transparent when you're hurting, without asking for prayer, without showing up. We don't just do this because it's something we made up. It's something that comes right from the top guy. Community is a big deal. Gathering together is a big deal. Praying together is a big deal. I hope that we all realize that today. 
with no one to encourage you, to challenge you, to help you discern the heart of God for the human story, for your story, the very scary thing. Yes? Worship team, if you want to make your way up here. Again, just coming back to John, if you don't know, John's ministry, preparing the way for Jesus, they did it kind of side by side. He had his own disciples. And then the king at the time, his name was Herod, he was doing some sinful stuff. And he really respected John, but he didn't really care what he, he had to say about his sinful nature. He didn't want to hear it. So he imprisoned John. John was in prison. And when John was in prison, he was obviously out of touch with his community. He didn't find himself rescued from his current situation. I think he was desperately praying that he would be rescued from prison, that God had something more for him to do, something else for him to do. I think that when that didn't happen, he began to doubt his purpose. I think he began to doubt who Jesus was. And again, this is all outside of community. So he sent two of his disciples to question Jesus. In Matthew 11, it says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things that the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah that we've been expecting? Or should we be looking for someone else? Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and what you've seen. The blind see, the lames walk, the lame walk, and those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear and the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. John's disciples returned to John, and they told him about the miraculous things that have been happening. And I believe that John was encouraged. I believe that being in community and being in relationship with those disciples and the word that they had for him encouraged him deeply. And I know that when he went to his death, he did so with a renewed faith, having received the word on what Jesus was doing. All of the things that he'd done, he'd worked so hard, he'd prepared for so many years, all of those he'd baptized, all of those he had discipled, all of the Pharisees he'd sworn at, all of the people, all of the things he'd been called to do were not for nothing. There was such purpose and nothing was wasted. And I think that's specifically in the Bible to encourage us how important it is for us to encourage each other. I think that there are specific people in our community who are called to be encouragers, and it is a big job. Because People, Christians, and the unsaved alike really struggle with not being discouraged. You hear me? It's tough, y'all. So find an encourager in this room, because there's a couple here, and even become an encourager yourself, okay? Read your Bible, get prayed up, show up. Show up. We want to do life with you. We want to do life with you. God's called us to it, and it's our desire to be with you in that way. Community is so important. I know that you guys can see it, you feel it, you sense it. You have friends who are, they get alone and they get weird. <laughs> humans, humans, we get alone, we get funky. It's like that drink that you drink half of and you just like accidentally leave in a corner for two weeks and this, it gets funk <laughs> on its own. We, that is not better that way. Do not listen to that man. <laughs> when we get alone and we, we pull away and we think that the Bible is, is saying something that it's not, we get funky, dudes. We need to come together. We need to ask our questions. That's why when I open today, I meant it. Ask questions. Hit us up. Ask your questions. Ask somebody next to you. Wrestle it out. Welcome the Holy Spirit in. You will get, you will get your correct answer. You will get your truth from Jesus. It's, it comes from the one source. Yes? 
So don't get weird, people. And at this point, I believe that we are all desert dwellers. All of us. We have to choose what category we fall into, though. Are we retreating to the desert to be in the presence of God? Or are we trying to escape? Are we going to the wilderness to escape? The difference is how we're seeking that wilderness. Chris was looking for an escape. Jesus and John, they knew it as a retreat. Where they went, they were edified, they were built up. They received a word from God. And there was such freedom and truth and life in the full presence of God and with his community. I love the line of scripture. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to a path of peace. And if that is not so desperately needed right now, I don't know what is. If you would just stand and close your eyes, I'm going to pray over you, and we're going to go back into a song of worship. That scripture says, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and guide us to a path of peace. And you are being called out of the darkness this morning. You are being called out of the shadow of death. Jesus wants to help guide your feet to the path of peace. And as we pray this morning, don't just pray it over yourself. Pray it over our world, okay? Because our world needs that so desperately. Jesus, thank you, Father God, for your presence in this place, Jesus. I know that you are speaking to every single person here far better than I ever could, Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity, Jesus. And I I ask and I pray, God, that you would just make this make sense. Make your truth make sense to every single person in this room under the sound of my voice. Speak to them better than I ever could, Lord. God, you humble me, Jesus. You humble me by giving me the opportunity to come and do this, Lord, but I know that it is you that does the heavy lifting. It's you that's there amid the wrestling, Father God. And as we accept your Holy Spirit in this place, Jesus, as it is calling us out of the darkness, as it's calling us out of those repetitious thoughts of of quarreling, God, of unforgiveness, Jesus, of offense, Lord, as you're pulling us out of that shadow of death, God, right now, Jesus, your people are so grateful, Jesus. They're so open to you, Lord. I pray that your presence would just be received right now. And as the band prepares to just take us into another moment of worship, God, we thank you that you are leading our feet to that path of peace, Jesus. You are leading our feet to that path of peace, God. You are drawing our hearts away from violence, Jesus, and you are calling us to peace. Lord, you are calling your world to peace, Lord. God, we thank you for that, and we glorify you, and all of God's saints said amen. If you all want to start clapping your hands, we're going to make some noise.
gloomy outside but that will shake the mud from your boots amen come on well hey a few things real quick as we get ready to end today can we just give it up for pastor adrian what a great message come on two if you didn't realize evidently zach kramer is the modern day john the baptist uh by those descriptors three three hey three we are a house of prayer amen and uh, three, if you feel like you have back pain in the house today, can you just go and see our prayer team in the back? We just feel like there's an anointing for back pain to be healed today. And my back is feeling great. I got prayed over before service. And if you would have seen me, I was walking around like, ah, uh, you know, like, so I'm just saying there's anointing for back pain. Um, two, I just want to say as well, um, I don't know where she got off to. Hey, hey, Ange, what's up, girl? I know. She goes, oh, no. You don't say that. Uh, Angie is the greatest. Angie serves in so many capacities here at TakeOver. And legit, I just want to take a moment to highlight you as our volunteer highlight of the week. Can you guys give it up for Angie? Micah, can you run that to Angie for me? That'd be amazing. We just want to say we love you. Thank you for how you serve, how you sacrifice. And uh, yes, so please take yourself out for coffee on us and just uh, get some good coffee. Sound good? Awesome. And one more thing real quick. Um, what's up, Calvin? Handsome. Handsome Saint you. Uh, when do we start saying handsome devil, by the way? Can we throw that out? That's annoying. Uh, but hey, if you don't know, we have an incredible, um, man, I'm just going to call it a ministry that's a part of TakeOver Church. Uh, it's called Temple Fitness. It's called Temple Fighters. It's called uh, Ninth Street Dojo. There's just an incredible thing that our people are a part of that they're doing coming alongside young men and women who want to learn how to fight but also channel some of the things from their history into a po yes there you go a mom answer a positive impact but also um one of the cool things is though is that we actually have legit like MMA fighters and competitors who are pushing themselves to the humanly limit all to bring glory to God at the end of it through how they compete and how they wrestle and how they fight. And our man Calvin has a fight coming up this weekend. So I don't mean to put you on the spot, bro. And I mean to put you on the spot. But here's this. Psalms one, uh, 144 verse 1. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. And so, bro, I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave today without having a chance to pray over you. So, friends, this is Calvin. He is the hero, Harbaugh. He is going to be fighting this weekend at a higher weight class than normal. Can we just extend a hand to him as he goes into this weekend, as he goes into his last week of training? So, Father God, I just thank you so much for Calvin. I thank you for his heart, God, that he doesn't compete for bloodlust, God. He competes to bring glory to the Most High God. I thank you, Father, for what you've made him to be, God. I thank you for how you've trained him, how you've raised him up for the life that he's had, God, that it all worked together for the glory of those who love the Lord. So I just pray over him and Tara as they go into this week of training, of, 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 um, of weight cutting and all the things that go into it, Father God, or weight gaining on his behalf. But, Father, I just thank you, God that you are taking this week so seriously because at this moment, your son, he gets to go and he gets to compete, God. This isn't about beating another man to a bloody pulp. This is about competition, God, all so that he can bring glory to your name at the end of it. 
And Father, I just thank you for the fact that he is a coach to many. He is a brother to many. He is a friend to many. He is a pastor and leader, God, in his community. And I just thank you, God, that through this week, there's going to be such a grace, such an anointing on him, Father God, to go and shine the light on the thing that needs to be shined on right now, and that is your son, Jesus, God. So as he fights, as he competes, as he gets methodical and trains, God, I ask that the provision would be there. I ask that for the the path would be lit before him. I ask God that he would see things in the supernatural God that maybe isn't normal to the naked natural eye, God. That he would compete knowing that he is going to bring all glory to you, God. And you know what? If everybody else in the world gets to pray over their daggum sports teams, God, I thank you that we're going to get the W on Wednesday. In Jesus' mighty name, the Faithful Church said, Amen. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm sick of people praying for Tom Brady, okay? Like, we're praying for Calvin and the amazing guys and girls there. So, hey, man, we love you, and uh, let's do it for Jesus. So, friends, hey, what a great Sunday. Stick around, enjoy the cafe, hang out, meet somebody new. If you're new, fill out a welcome home card. But hey, pump the jams. Let's have a great rest of the morning. We love you. Come on.